With that, I want to bring former U.S. Attorney General, attorney in many important human rights cases, and has called for impeachment of Bush in 2003. Please welcome Ramsey Clark. the 1960s, it was my fate to speak after an African-American Southern preacher. And everybody always went to sleep when I talked. <laughs> There's nothing like them, I'll tell you. Their passion and um, purpose is beautiful to see. This issue of impeachment is, to me, the great challenge of the American people in our time and perhaps in all time. It will determine whether we have a chance of reaching back toward the American dream of a government off by and for the people. Impeachment is real. Its history is powerful. The men, there are no women, there's been some improvement, who wrote the Constitution, <clears throat> were vitally and painfully aware of the importance and the power of impeachment. British history, which was their history, at that time the United States came in the category of current events, taught them that Impeachment was the most important instrumentality of self-representation in government of, by, and for the people. <clears throat> they saw it as the most powerful political weapon, as they put it in the debates, short of civil war. We have a runaway presidency, a decider that would make George III blush for his arrogance and his determination to impose his will on everybody and everything that gets in his way. All the Articles of government that create the government and our Constitution. Article 1, creating the legislative branch. Article 2, the executive branch. Article 3, the judicial branch. Contain important provisions about impeachment. There's no single issue that's more intertwined and ingrained in the Constitution in more places than the issue of impeachment. In Article 1, we're told that the House of Representatives has the sole power of impeachment. Also in Article 1, we're told the Senate has the sole power to try a case of impeachment. It has to convict by two-thirds. When the President is under impeachment, the Chief Justice of the United States will provide, preside. There are seven specific different references to the power of impeachment in the Constitution. And they perceive that power as the single most important advance that Britain had made in liberating itself from the monarchy. There had been more than 100 impeachments in 20 years between 1620 and 1640 against King James I and Charles I. It was the weapon by which they finally brought some rights to the people. And they didn't want a George III to preside under the Constitution of the United States. And they told us in every way they possibly could, pay attention to this power. 
It's power in the people because their representatives are directed to wield it. And it's a mandatory power. Article 2, Section 4 of the Constitution says the president, the vice president, and that's important here. <laughs> you haven't noticed? <clears throat> and other civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office upon impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. The phrase high crimes and misdemeanors had 400 years of history in English jurisprudence and government in 1787. It was hardly a vaguely an undefined standard. Yet we've tended to trifle with it. In my time, we've trifled with it. In the cases that I've struggled on in impeachment, they've basically ended in outrage. <laughs> I've often called William O. Douglas one of the last free people in this country. He said what he thought, he thought profoundly. How many here remember that he was impeached, or rather a resolution of impeachment, 26 Republicans, led by Gerald Ford, the majority leader of the House of Representatives, sought to impeach one of the greatest judicial officers in the history of the United States for trash. The main, the main ground that they gave was he was the sole vote in favor of First Amendment protection for a movie called uh, I Am Furious Yellow. And they went to a lot of trouble. They set up a room off the floor of the House of Representatives and they showed it continuously. And if you watch, you'd see congressmen coming out rubbing their eyes for the third time saying, terrible, terrible, impeach Douglas. <laughs> when he was asked, Douglas said, oh, I never saw the movie. He said, if I want to see a movie, I go to a theater and I buy a ticket. I didn't need to see the movie because I'd seen the Constitution. Yep. I've read the Constitution of the United States. It said the Congress will make no law, <laughs> no law, interfering with freedom of speech. And I voted to protect the First Amendment of the Constitution. Yeah. show you how trivialized uh, a man who became president of the United States, and pardon the man who should have been impeached. And I watched it from the gallery because I was one of the lawyers accused. Gerald Ford came to the rostrum the floor in the well of the house <clears throat> and finally <clears throat> came to the point and said, what then is an impeachable offense? And he turned to himself as if he were answering the person who'd asked the question. <laughs> and he said, to be honest, it's a prejudice of mine. When someone says, tell the truth, or to be honest, I say, what's it been all the rest of the time we've been talking? <laughs> but, um, anyway, he said, to be honest, an impeachable offense is whatever a majority of the House of Representatives say it is at a given moment in history. That's an exact quote. That means there is no standard, there is no law, it's whatever the will of the House of Representatives at a given moment says it is. But that's not the 400 year history of the words. And if words don't have meaning and we can't enforce their meaning, then there's really no hope for human intelligence, is there? Because it's just a matter of will and power. <laughs>